pretty precise conjecture and then I'll tell you what we are doing to, to test it. And I'm going to tell you the, making the list of my collaborators, okay? You can, yes, you can ask Google and uh, Google knows everything about me. In, in, uh, but, but, but doesn't yet know what I'm thinking. Okay, so I'll try to tell you what I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> so, um, I'll start with some uh, motivation. That's section one. And so many years ago, uh, Vasily Galushev proposed to me that I should classify finite varieties using mirror symmetry, namely trying to classify their mirrors first. And um, uh, you know, for a long time, I <laughs> didn't understand this. But um, I want to say at least a couple of words as to why this works, actually, or, you know, if you insist, why this will work. So first, though, I want to say what the final varieties. And um, I'm going to write here, we all know, people here all know, that there are 105 uh, deformation families of smooth final threefolds. And so, well, we could try to redo this classification by using mirror symmetry. But then, uh, there is Q final threefolds. And um, we, we don't know much about the classification of these. So you mean these orbitals? Right? Yes. Uh, I mean special orbital singularities of the form 1 over R A minus A1. These are terminal uh, singularities. You, you could also ask for more general orbitals. Yeah, this is quotient uh, of mu R acting with those weights. Or perhaps. Uh, non-singular fan of four folds. So these are the kind of things that I'd like to be able to study. And so I do want to say a couple of words as to why it works. And uh, please forgive me, I'm not. Uh, why does it work? So assume that you have a toric degeneration. So I have a family uh, curly X over some base S. Um, oh, by the way, mirror symmetry is a theory of Calabi-Yau pass. So here. I have a divisor B inside X, and it's in the anti-canonical system, so that the pair XB is a Calabi-Yau pair, KX plus B, trivial. So I have such a family, and then I have a point in S where uh, the fiber is a toric variety, and B is the toric boundary, okay? Uh, so why am I even say this? Well, the <laughs> what I'm trying to drive at is, in this case, if there is a torque degeneration, I want to justify the statement that the mirror is a Laurent polynomial. And you know, the idea would work like this. Uh, if t is small, then um, x t 
the fiber xt, yeah, so you know, I'm repeating here, xb here is a toric funnel, okay? And uh, yeah, and B is the, the boundary, the toric boundary. No, very important, not smooth. Arbitrary toric singularities. That's a key point. Um, so you expect the XT to have an exact uh, Lagrangian torus in it. Lt, uh, you know, to be close. Exactly. Sorry, exactly. that the form omega is uh, d of a function. Minus, maybe minus d. Yeah, in the complement of b. Yes, yes, uh, absolutely. You know, this would be close to, so, you know, the central fiber is a toric variety and has a moment map, and I just take mu minus one of the origin, or, yeah. And then, uh, literally, the, the mirror would be, the potential would be W to be the sum of, um, you know, all disks. Uh, in X with boundary on L or LT if you like and um, you know D dot minus K equal 1 or maybe muscle index 2 the of X to the boundary of D the class of the boundary of D and this is supposed to be a finite a polynomial Okay, so I don't know if this is rigorous at the moment. Uh, um, maybe you can explain it to me, but it's expected, you, you know. And the things I write down, I think are, I think are these things. Okay. And so somehow, um, whereas uh, on one side of mirror symmetry we're looking at funnel varieties, which are complicated things. Uh, you know, in particular things that it's hard to put your hand on. On the other side, you just have Laurent polynomials with integral coefficients. If we were somehow able to um, determine the exact class of Laurent polynomials that are mirror to funnels, then we'd be done. And uh, the other thing I want to say is uh, perhaps a little more philosophical and uh, that uh, by rational geometry is difficult but when we do classification of funnels we're interested in deformations of funnels, deformation families and uh, so then that gets translated into the by rational geometry of the mirror or more precisely uh, volume preserving by rational geometry of the mirror that's much easier Okay, so that's. Um, Can I ask, do you expect all panels to have this sort of generation? Yeah, everybody asks me that, and uh, the answer is I'm not sure. And, and so, if you like, everything I say is going to be limited to those panels that do. Uh, and if it does, does it have only one or possibly many? Many, and that's something I will talk about. Okay. Yes. Yeah, we needed some additional condition of the total space of a technical nature that I'm not discussing. Absolutely. Basically, it has to be Q Gorenstein degenerate. You know, there, is, there are uh, results in the literature that claim to prove that every final has a torque degeneration. I'm, I'm not sure of the status of, of this, uh, in any case, they certainly all do. 
Huh? Singular. Yeah, so, uh, oh yeah, yeah. Well, of course, uh, there are some singular um, orbifold del pezzo surfaces that do not admit the ectoric degeneracy. It turns out that they also seem to have a nice mirror, but that's a different story. No, we're not going to talk about that today. So, to motivate uh, basically the conjecture I will tell you later, I need to paint a somewhat more precise picture of uh, mirror symmetry for fan varieties. And that's what I will do next. Okay, so mir what's mirror symmetry? This is going to be sort of a purely impressionistic account. So on the one hand of the mirror, we have a toric degeneration. Uh, as before, this curly x b to some base s. And uh, the center, a fiber at some point, is a toric fan variety. By the way, for me, X is always a normal, irreducible toric fan variety. On the other hand, uh, we have this uh, Laurent polynomial. So here we are, maybe in dimension n, and this is an n variable Laurent polynomial. So a regular function on C star n. Um, so see, on this side, uh, I have this central fiber. It's a toric variety. And the fan of this, of this toric variety is the polytope. Sorry. Fan of x is the spanning fan of a polytope. P. And uh, so we're in torque geometry, so P is an integer, it's a lattice polytope, convex, and so on, in N. And um, over here, it's useful to compactify W to a, a torque variety, uh, we call it Y bar d bar, boundary d bar. And see, that's just, uh, you know, after all, p, this p here is the Newton uh, polytope of w, and y bar is the torque variety whose fan is the normal fan of p. And uh, then, uh, now, W is not a morphism on Y bar, and then one resolves the base locus, and then W becomes a morphism uh, on Y to P1. Okay. And um, this morphism here is a log crepent. I'm just saying words here log resolution. So uh, F is a log crep and log resolution. And as I said, I'm just painting some kind of picture, OK? And uh, so uh, as a mathematician, you think, you know, uh, maybe I can derive it from pure thought, or maybe uh, there, there are some statements, some text, you know, uh, that you can read. And there is not, not, none of those things. This is just my experience with many thousands of examples. This is what I see. Yeah, if you like. <clears throat> so you start with okay, you take so there's the span of P. Yeah. P is the Newton polytope of W. So here we're still on yeah. the X side. And then what? 
Okay, so then you take W, you compactify. Yeah, so th there is a natural torque variety, yeah, such yeah. that W is a section of a line bundle yeah. on that torque variety, and that has fan, the normal fan of, yeah, of P. Yeah, yeah. And then I, I want to resolve the base locus, okay? okay? And, it's, and, and I'm telling you that the base locus can be resolved in a very constrained way, okay? These are... And then after you've done it, obviously it goes to... Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so I'm saying that, that the resolution is a log crep and log resolution. So I'm saying that YD is log smooth. That's what log resolution means. And log crepent, it has a technical definition, something like uh, for every divisor E in Y that is F exceptional, the discrepancy of E over KY plus D bar is zero. Okay? That's what log crepent means. It's not toric. Not toric. It looks like this. You, you know what it looks like. So I start from a torque variety. Yeah, this is a torque variety with its boundary. And uh, the log Kreppen maps there, I'm just blowing up points in the boundary. OK? And sometimes I blow them up again. But again, it has to be in the boundary. So I'm, I'm allowed to block this point again. And so then I get a picture like that. And that's a sort of a higher dimensional version of this, uh, of this thing. Sorry? Sorry? Yes. Yes. It's your, your sense. In particular, outside of D, Y is smooth. Uh, the toric variety. The toric variety with Fan, the normal fan of P. No, no, uh, it's sort of dual, dual, dual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dual. And, and so far, what you've written on the right hand side depends only on the torque variety and not the torque generation. It does, no, it does depend on the torque degeneration as well. Okay. I haven't told you that, but actually it does. I, 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 you will see that if you start with the torque variety, and so the polytope P, there will be different Ws that you can put on it. And they will correspond to different ways to smooth out the torque variety. And uh, so, yeah, it does depend. I want to zoom in. I will tell you how to make the W. If I just tell you how to make the W, you will not know where it comes from, okay? But if I tell you the picture, then you will see why I'm, get, where, why I'm getting to where I'm going. I think, I hope. <clears throat> so anyway, just to, to clarify maybe a little bit, the remark I said earlier, this log crep and log resolution this is a bio-rational map that preserves the natural volume form. This guy is a Clavier pair, this guy is a Clavier pair. That morphism preserves the volume form. And so that's part of what I was saying, that mirror symmetry translates things about deformations on this side to things about volume preserving bio-rational maps on this side. <coughs> and that kind of bio-rational geometry is actually, I mean, we still don't know much about it, but there's a lot of work to do, but, but it's easier than arbitrary by Russian geom. So, yes? So this, the YD box, well, what does it mean about Y by itself? Smooth. It's smooth. Yeah. Outside of D. <coughs> Where, all, along D, it will have some toric uh, singularity. So it's smooth outside. Of but D. Just no, uh, it has toroidal singular. Outside, 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 outside D is indeed. Uh, no, 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 it's not just the torus because I I blown up these curves and so it's this thing with with these uh, additional 
curves. Thanks. Uh, I should mention here that the I will not talk much about that, but uh, um, there is the picture of intrinsic mirror symmetry that Bernd maybe will talk about. And uh, so we're here, uh, we, ca we can recover X as, um, you know, R rather x might, well, okay, this is not very convincing, although that it is true that x minus b is the spec of some uh, log quantum cohomology of the pair y d. And uh, the base of the deformation S then uh, would be the spec of some uh, modicum of you know, maybe Y over Y bar. And you know, there are various versions and various uh, checks and balances. I'm not sure. And maybe at this point, this is just expected in general but may be proved in low dimension or surfaces or something. And in fact, more precise, this is not super convincing, but you know, it's not just that x minus b, but all of x is reconstructible from this ring by some kind of Ries construction. Let's not go there. The, uh, there is now a precise and super direct way to go from here to here in principle. Okay, so the other, uh, so this is more or less the picture, expected or conjectural. But I also want to say that there would be a local version of this picture. And um, Where I mean, literally, um, if F is a facet of P, then I can take the cone over F, and then the toric variety X sigma in X is an open subset. It's a risky open subset. And uh, on this side, um, well, W uh, is a polynomial with Newton polyta P. So I can write W as sum V in P. Uh, some coefficient a sub v then x to the v, okay? And then here I can take wf to be the part of, uh, of w that's supported on that cone. So I'm taking v in sigma f, sigma, and then I just take a v x to the v, okay? And this thing is supposed to be the mirror of the affine variety x sigma. And uh, there is supposed to be some local to global compatibility of these things. Yes, precisely. So you can, uh, and, and I, I will, uh, uh, this is exactly where, I'm, where, where I, what I want you to think, that after all, uh, this data is supposed to instruct how to deform the, the open subset X sigma. And the compatibility, this data to get, so it gives yourself a bunch of WFs. 
then you form a W out of those WFs. Then you have uh, to worry about whether these deformations glue. Yeah, that uh, there is a correspondence between these WFs and deformations of the affine variety X sigma. Something, in fact, this is the one thing that I will make really precise in a, in a moment. So maybe, maybe this can wait. <clears throat> okay, so what I want to do next, I want to give you, I want to tell you what are some of my objectives for the near and uh, medium term uh, future. I mean this as realistic, okay? And then I'm going to zoom in on uh, just one particular aspect. So here are some objectives. So, essentially, so the first objective is I want to make a conjecture and test it. Test it numerically by computer and maybe in some special cases also prove it. Now this conjecture I want to make for three folds. Smooth th final three folds. Uh, I'd like to make it for Q final three folds. Several uh, contexts and four folds. Okay, and you know maybe some other context. A sort of mirror symmetry conjecture. Okay, and so I will make it more precise in one case later. But uh, the meta statement. is to look like the following. So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence. Between, on the one hand, certain final Calabi-Yau pass up to deformation. And on, on the other hand, um, the, oh, there is a lattice polytope P in N. And if you know, for every facet of P, some uh, polynomial, some Laurent polynomial WF, uh, with Newton polytope equal F and then some compatibility or gluing condition and uh, Yeah, yeah, in particular, that would, they would have to, uh, but there's more to it than that. And, uh, and this, this data, I want to take up to mutation. And it should be a, an operation of mutation, and I'm telling you these two sets are to be in one-to-one -one correspondence. So if you remember, some of you will remember, some of you are too young to remember, when I... <laughs> When uh, mirror symmetry first came about, you know, mathematicians would look at each other. And what the, what is this thing? Is it some correspondence between what and what? Between is it is there is there a one to one correspondence? No, some people would dare to ask: Is there a one to one correspondence between a set and a set and a b set? And then people would say: No, 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 we don't expect that. Maybe many to one, whatever. Okay, so I propose to finally na completely nail down that question. There is a one to one correspondence, and this is what you have on one side. That's what you have on the other side. <coughs> Yes. 
So this is for Fano Calabiao pairs. In other words, that you have a Fano and then a divisor in the anticanonical system. So there is a different use of this word. Fano Calabiao pair. Ah, but what about the pair bit? Yeah, yeah, so this is this money over here. So, okay. So, so four dimensional cubic is exactly. I see, I see. Is it clear what I mean here? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. I didn't know about this, okay, anyway. So that's the first objective. And so in a sense, uh, we've already done this in the case of surfaces, but then uh, threefold is a bit, quite a bit more complicated already. So this is why it's taking quite a while to, to do. Um, another, so, so this is, I think, reasonable. Uh, th because we have a lot of evidence, numerical data and so on, and so we should be able to put this together now in, in a way that looks plausible. The second objective is going to be classify the right-hand side, namely, uh, this is just combinatorics now, by computer. And, you know, there are various challenges with the size of that uh, thing. Um, just, just maybe I just want to say, so for fourfolds, we will want to walk through the database of 400 million reflexive polytopes, okay? And so you need uh, to have the database stored properly, and you need to be able to query it send a query, bring me all those reflexive four-dimensional polytopes with this and that characteristic. And you need, you need the, the answer to come back quickly enough. And that's what the guys that are working with the computer are having problem with right now. And so it completely astonishes me because uh, uh, I read somewhere that you know, Cambridge Analytica had something like a thousand data points on each and every, uh, you know, 100 million Americans. And uh, they were able, obviously, to run a computation, which was not very difficult, just some machine learning thing, but still, on each and every one of those data points. And I just I wish I knew how they did it, okay? I, I, I mean, maybe we should hire one of them people to, to do this work. <coughs> Uh, so, now what about proving some theorems? And I think the, the one that is sort of realistic, uh, that looks doable, is to uh, show, prove that there is a map this way, okay? Uh, so in, in other words, once I have this combinatorial data, then I can construct the funnel, and I can try to prove that a smoothing exists. It would be a singular toric funnel, and then this data will instruct will be instruction how to do the smoothing. And there are various uh, technologies for doing this, none of them at this stage where that, that, that allows to do this easily, okay? But let's do it. I'm telling you, once, once, the, once, the, once this part, once the, the conjecture has been stated and it looks plausible, then, of course. And in a moment, I will tell you exactly an example of such a condition. Uh, 
the thing that you don't know is what exactly this right hand side is. And uh, so, you know, you know there is a W, but then, you know, you, you know it's, it's discussable, okay? It's discussable. Indeed, it's discussable. Um, so the the problem the sorry what did you say? The, the I didn't understand. Oh, oh, the mutation bit. Uh, yes, indeed, I was about to say. In principle, the, 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 I have to examine all possible polytopes, infinitely many polytopes. Oh. That's the, definitely the expectation. And uh, I, I would prefer to talk about cluster varieties rather than mutations, but it would take me longer. I cannot compress it in one hour. Okay. So if I had three or four hours, then I would do a more geometric presentation of this, of this, uh, of this thing. So I want to zoom in on a particular context and just give you, pre now this is a meta conjecture. At least in, in one context, I'm going to give you absolutely precise conjecture. Okay? And um, uh, this is the conjecture I'm going to write here. And this is a, a purely local conjecture. So suppose that F is a polygon in a two dimensional lattice. So this is a lattice polygon. And I consider the three-dimensional cone where I take f, I put it at height 1 in z3, and I take the associated uh, the cone spanned by this f. And so, you know, x sigma then would be a uh, affine, a, a Gorenstein toric affine variety. Okay? And the conjecture is that there is a one to one correspondence between uh, smoothing components, smoothing components of X sigma on the one hand. And uh, on, the other, on the other side, I put these things which I call zero mutable polynomials, uh, W, with newt W equal F. <clears throat> I mean a uh, component of the versatile deformation space such that the fiber of a general point is smooth. <clears throat> so I'm, I have to tell you what this uh, zero mutable business is. Um, and I will give you some examples of that. And then a little bit of evidence for the conjecture. And then I will also tell you how we plan to test it more seriously. And again, it's, it's uh, not so easy. Uh, what's, what's more clear is, cut, is how to go from here to here. A zero mutable thing will give a smoothing component, but I don't know the other way around. Anyway, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll discuss that a little bit later a bit more later. So this zero mutable stuff is just a little combinatorial game. And uh, in fact, I can do it in all dimensions. So suppose that L, L here is an affine 
rank R lattice. So, you know, abstractly isomorphic to Z to the R, but I haven't chosen an origin. And then I want to define what it means for a uh, Laurent polynomial. Well, it's not really Laurent polynomial because I haven't chosen an origin. I, it's some kind of module of things. I'm not, I'm not sure what to call it. An element of C of L to be zero mutable. OK? And so this is an inductive definition where I know that certain things are zero mutable, and then that implies that certain other things are zero mutable. So, uh, so for every L in L, a monomial is always zero mutable. So that's, that's what I'm telling you. Um, if uh, L1 minus L2, this is an element of an, in the underlying vector space, if this is primitive, then uh, I'm saying that x to the L1 plus x to the L2 to any power is zero mutable. Then uh, uh, if F1 and F2 are zero mutable, then so is their product. And finally, if f is zero mutable, then so is, is a mutation of f. So for that to make sense, I have to tell you what's a, how to mutate. It's a mutation. So this is mutation. So to know how to mutate in rank R, you need to know who the zero mutables in rank R minus 1 are. I, I understand. This is combinatorics. I will do some examples. It's pretty easy. So um, and then I will be done at the end of this board. So um, right. So the mutation data. Our phi, our pair, is a pair phi h, where phi is an integral affine map from L to Z. And uh, h is a Laurent polynomial with Newton polytope uh, contained in the, in the kernel of phi 0, where phi 0 is the linear part of phi. And H is zero mutable. OK, so given mutation data, I'm going to tell you how to mutate F now. So you have to write F as sum over K in Z, FK, where Newton of FK is contained in phi minus 1 K. And then the mutation of f is sum h to the k fk. And here k is running over the integers. And uh, this, is, this is only defined if for k negative, I want that h to the minus k, if you like, divides fk. So this is a condition of f. And uh, I say that f is mutable if that works, and then this is its mutation. This is a generalization of the Yes. Yes. It's the sort of um, affine version of that. 
there is no skew linear form here. There is only a volume form. Yes. <coughs> so um, let me give a couple of examples, OK, of this thing. Uh, because uh, you've probably seen this, where this phi is an element, is just an element of the dual of L. L is not an affine thing, but it's a vector space. It's, it's a lattice. And, but here, I, I allow it to, to be just an affine thing. And so, uh, the, the most important one here is the last one, so I'm just going to raise everything except that. So why do I call it zero mutable? Because uh, f is zero mutable if I can mutate it to zero, to nothing. It goes away after a bunch of mutations. And that has a, a very nice geometric interpretation to the cluster variety that I'm not going to talk about today. Uh, and so let me, examples. So consider f to be this polygon. OK? Uh, and so I consider Laurent polynomials, of which this thing is the Newton uh, polygon. And uh, I denote that just by, see, these dots are monomials. And I will just put a little number there. And that means that I consider the polynomial where that monomial appears with coefficient 1. And so here is an example of a um, of a, a zero mutable polynomial. Okay, I put a three here. Okay, and let me show you why it's zero mutable. I'm going to choose the affine map that puts these three monomials here at level minus 2, these two monomials here at level minus 1, and this one goes at level 0, and this one goes at level 1. Okay? And so when I do the mutation, I divide, so then the h is going to be 1 plus y. Okay, so you imagine this is just 1 x, x squared, and x cubed, OK? Then y, y squared. So and you know the mutability condition is indeed 1 plus y divides this polynomial here. Sorry, 1 plus y squared, I'm level minus 2. And indeed, that's 1 plus 2y plus y squared. It's divisible by 1 plus 1 squared. And uh, when I divide it, I'm left with just 1. Here I have x, 3x times 1 plus y, and I divide that by 1 plus y, so that's 3. Nothing happens here. And then I'm just left with the one-dimensional polynomial 1 plus x cubed. Okay, And I did say that uh, the cube of a polynomial from 1 plus x is always 0. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. Thank you. You're right, absolutely. Uh, very good. So I need to do one more step now, uh, where I put this guy here at height minus 3, and this one here at height 0. And then when I mutate again, I divide that bit there by 1 plus x cube. And uh, that guy stays the same. OK, so that's the next. Uh, yes? You always have this in this example you did, in both examples, that yes. kind of the boundaries lie in the uh, five over uh, one plus x cube. 
Yes. Okay. Uh, the definition does not require you to, but uh, you, you, you can try to do other mutations and they are completely useless. Okay. okay. These are the ones that, that uh, help you. Okay. Yeah, please. Can you tell me which disks are being calculated on which the Okay, okay, okay. Uh, this is uh, not not right now, no, but that's something that could, we, could, we could talk about this. In fact, hopefully you can tell me after after we exchange some information. <laughs> but you see, that's the part to some extent, but, but if I if want uh, uh, a, a sort of philosophical, that's the part that I don't understand and then I don't deal with it. I'm into making fun of varieties. Not in grabbing a fun of varieties and counting discs on it, but going to some other world to make fun of varieties. So I just start with a plausible looking disc count and then I want to make that fun of variety that has that count. Mm -hmm. you want the other area, you want the yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you know, I'd be really glad if you know if you come and tell me you can help. Then that's, I, I love that. Okay. So there is another one here, and uh, on the on the same on the same polygon, there is another uh, zero mutable polynomial. And that has coefficient 2 here. OK? And uh, so for that, uh, you want to put the base of the triangle at height, say, um, now, that's interesting. Um, yeah. And, uh, and then I want to put this one here at height minus 1, okay, and then this one here would go at height 1. And so, you know, the condition here is that, you know, 1 plus x cubed divides this thing here, and so it goes away. That 1 plus x divides this, and, and it does, so, and then nothing happens here, and so that's, I just get this, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Very good, very good. Okay. And so, but anyway, this also I can move into nothing, you know, easily. So, uh, in terms of the conjecture, here's perhaps I want to comment a couple of things now, just the conjecture. So, um, remarks. So, the conjecture is true, is known to be true, when uh, x sigma has isolated singularities. And that's just a rephrasing of the work of Klaus Altmann. It's open in the case of non-isolated singularities. Now, in particular, this example here, for, for sigma is in this example, for sigma in the example, um, x sigma does not have isolated singularities. x sigma is an affine variety, a quotient of mu 6 with weights 1, 2, 3. And so the deformation space is infinite dimensional. That's not a problem. In this particular case, we know how to compute it. And indeed, it has two components. And the two components correspond to these two zero metal polynomials that I told. Sorry? I see. So yeah, so this direction uh, is morally, we haven't yet written a proof, okay, 
but, but uh, this, this direction should be okay. And let me sketch it. Every time I have a mutation, then I can write down a pencil over P1 that deforms x sigma to x to the, muta to the cone over the mutated polynomial. And by do if I so so if I have a chain of mutation that disappears into nothing, then I mutate I, I have a, a family over P1 and another family over P1. These P1 are attached to one another. At the beginning I have X sigma, at the end I have a smooth space. Okay. What's not super obvious is that there is something that interpolates. They could be in different components of the deformations, these P1s. Ah yes, uh, 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 th 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 but that's but that's uh, th th but that's exactly the that's a, th 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 that's that, that's easier because um, sorry uh, that's easier because the, the multiplication has to do also with mutations that are supported on the face somehow, and so that brings us back to the you may, in the work of Altman, if f is a Minkowski sum of f1 plus f2. Then I can write a family with two parameters, uh, where the general fiber is uh, uh, some intermediate thing. But then on the two axes, I have x f1, x, x f2. And then the center point, I have x of f1 plus f2. So that's the, that's the product uh, fits in that, in that picture. So you know this direction is quite plausible. The other direction is. Uh, more like the kind of wishful thinking than if you find something that works, then maybe it works even better than, <laughs> you know, that's the. So, uh, okay, so l l I have just a couple minutes left. So let me try to say uh, this. So uh, if we talk now about smooth final three folds, okay, so. So we're working on, maybe I can, I can try to state a conjecture here, which is in many ways not optimal, but still uh, it, it says it's, it's definitely not, not vacuous. Suppose that I take here P a reflexive 3D polytope. There are not many of this. There are, you know, 4,319. It's almost like human scale. Okay. Uh, I suppose that now for every facet of P, choose. Now we are exactly in this situation of this conjecture here. So choose a zero mutable. So I am given here uh, W F. Zero mutable. And then uh, there is a compatibility condition. And we consider this stuff up to mutation. Then this should be should contain 98 elements, this set. These are the 98 families of final threefolds with minus k very ample. I'm not, I haven't told you what the compatibility condition is. And we have two or three variants, OK? And now at present, we are testing this by computer. Is this true or not? Uh, let, me, let me tell you just one variant in uh, slightly slogan form. The compatibility condition is that if I now take the W, which has Newton policy of P. See, P is reflexive. So if I know WF for every F, and I, then I know what W is. I take the W such that WF is W restricted to F over F. And uh, I put zero at the origin, if you want. I take that W. And the complete condition is that W, when I form the Y-Bardi bar, has 
a log crap and log resolution. That's the compatibility condition. And it turns out that when you do the geometry of that, it becomes a little combinatorial game. Okay, that's what turns out. I, I'm doing this. And it is this game of this volume preserving by rational geometry that we're talking about. That's one of two or three proposals that we got. We don't know which one works. Uh, and we're testing them by computer, and maybe by the end of the summer we, we, we know one that works. And in particular, then, this would also test that conjecture, because there are 344 faces of these things, and they have many zero butables on them. And so, you know, then this is also a way to test that. You're absolutely right. And it did that. that's why I said, uh, in many ways, still unsatisfactory. The point is that if the, so the polytope, you do a mutation, the polytope is no longer reflexive. However, you can mutate, 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 and come back to a reflexive. And that's what I mean here. Ideally, this conjecture would have to be stated for all possible polytopes. And then I have to have a game of WFs and compatible conditions on an arbitrary quality. We're working on it, uh, but uh, first, uh, we, so we want to understand this case first because there's no, you know, it's practical, okay? We take one step at a time. Yeah, uh, but but also, yeah, yeah, yeah. On the other hand, on the other hand, uh, it's, it's more than that because really here we have a cluster variety. So this this mutation equivalents are different charts on a given cluster variety. So then we also know how to choose a chart such that at uh, that point we know how to construct the smoothing by deformation theory, that we've done that. So then we, we would actually be proving that uh, out of one of these things, there is a well understood smoothing. You know, I, I understand you prove much more of it. So it's now to check the statement. Oh, I see, I see, I see. No, no, no. But uh, but as uh, Maxim says, you, you know, you'd you'd, uh, you'd you'd also immediately what we pro what's happening is you look at the Laurent polynomial, you look at the we have the tables of the period sequence. So in fact, we we, we nail it down by gram of written invariance. Yeah. Okay.